will be in Matthew chapter 14 today. And truly what we're going to uncover in this series is that following after Jesus and being in the presence of Jesus leads to awe and wonder. Leads to awe and wonder. Uh, I have a statement I would like to share with you all uh, that I believe will produce, it is likely that it will produce a, an, an emotional response. Uh, I believe that this statement uh, is likely something you have said multiple times, and I almost guarantee if you have little children in your house, you have heard it said too many times. And so as I share this phrase, I want you to consider what, yeah, we already, we already snuck it out, huh? It's all right. We, the, the phrase that I want you to consider your response is, there is nothing to eat. There is nothing to eat. Shamefully, you have likely uttered these words before. Uh, if you're like me, and most, most of the men might maybe are like me, you open up the refrigerator and you stare at it like it's a TV show, but nothing's changing. You walk away, you come back, you do the same thing. Nothing changes. Uh, <laughs> kids... Kids, right, if you have children in your house, they, they, uh, they'll say this with kind of a, a sense of manipulation because you don't have what they want. And so there's nothing to eat. There's nothing that I want here. Didn't they, didn't they just eat? Uh, that's always the question we ask in, in our house out loud. I, I have a unique memory growing up, a unique memory of my grandparents, my grandfather babysitting us, my dad's dad. And uh, for whatever reason, I fully believed at that time that there was nothing to eat in our home. Probably not the truth, but at that time as a young child, I really believed that. And what we began to witness as kids was my grandfather doing something crazy. He began to pull items out of the refrigerator and the, the pantry, some slicing and dicing, some chopping, some mixing, some sauteing seasoning and tasting and served in warm bowls he served from nothing a feast i remember as a child looking at that whole experience and saying how did he do it there was nothing here to build that have you ever had an experience like this before where someone almost seemingly from nothing provided something really good in fact that's kind of you know you ever watched the show chopped we, we have these shows kind of built on. It's like, how could these possibly come together and make something good? From seemingly nothing, there is something produced that's awe-inspiring, that's astonishing. Well, this morning, uh, we will read about something way more amazing and unexpected. That in the scriptures, what we will study this morning is Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. And as we do so, we're going to be studying Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. We'll do so by looking at three points to help guide our time together. Compassion, concern and charge, and catering. Compassion, the first, the first point. After hearing about the murder of John the Baptist, Jesus retreats with his disciples. When he and the disciples come to shore, there is a large crowd that is formed in Jesus' heart's heart breaks for them. Concern and charge. After spending the day healing the sick, the disciples tell Jesus to send away the people so that they can find food for themselves. Jesus charges his disciples to feed the large crowd. With a, with a meager amount of food, Christ reveals to his disciples that only he can provide for their needs. And catering. Taking five loaves and two fish, Jesus blesses the food and sends out the disciples to feed the large crowd. Everyone has enough to eat and is satisfied with the remainder that can, can feed the disciples. Jesus displays he is God and is able to do the miraculous. What's unique about this miracle is that no other miracle in the scriptures is, is selected and discussed like this one, because in all four of the gospel accounts, this is the only one to be repeated. All four have, uh, have spent their time telling us that Jesus fed this really big crowd once. That there is something very unique and very special about this miracle that God has for us today. And so, 
Without further ado, let's get to it. Matthew chapter 14, 13 through 21. We'll read the whole passage out. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns, from, from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for this day, a day that you have made and you've set it aside for us. God, I pray that you would reveal to us your providential care and love, that you're a God who truly provides. You know our every need and you meet us with incredible compassion. And so today, Lord, I pray that you would show us yourself, that we'd be transformed by your love, that we'd be compelled to tell a world that's hurting and broken all about who you are. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So our first point, compassion. Jesus is on his way in a boat to a remote place. It says in the text here that he's going by himself. But what we know is if we study the life of Jesus is he never really is by himself. He's always with his crew. And in fact, the other three uh, accounts of this event says that Jesus is with his disciples. And so they go into a boat and they go away. Why? Because what we read previously in this chapter is that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, was murdered. He was murdered. Jesus is grieving, not only because of the loss of his cousin, but John the Baptist was an ally of his. John the Baptist and Jesus were preparing this world to repent. God was bringing something important. They were, he, they were preparing the way for the good news of Jesus to penetrate hearts. And now John has been murdered. He's dead. And so Jesus, in his grief, goes away from the crowds that are forming around him to retreat. And as he goes, they come uh, upon the shore, people see them off in a distance, and they walk around the sea, and they're ready for Jesus, a crowd. The, the, the text says 5,000 men. Most agree, most scholars believe it's about 15,000, maybe more, considering the women and children that would be with these men. This is a big crowd. It's a huge crowd, and they're waiting for Jesus. And the scriptures say, in Jesus' grief, he looks at them, and he has compassion. The Gospel of Mark's account says this, Jesus has compassion on them because he views them as sheep without a shepherd. The word compassion here is a Greek word. It's one of my favorite Greek words that I studied as I was in, in Bible college. It's the word splonkizomai. It's just fun to say. You could say it. Splonkizomai. I'm glad we translated compassion. It's much easier. Uh, this word, compassion, it means to be moved with pity, feeling it deeply in your inner parts. At the seed of your affections, there is a wrenching. It is a physical response to a, an emotional need. Jesus looks at these people as a sheep without a shepherd, the Gospel of Mark shares and he breaks for them. He breaks for them. Now, I, I, I look at this and I'm just so amazed. 
Because Jesus' compassion leads to him in action. He begins to heal those with illness. It propels him to be on mission, furthering the work that the God the Father sent him for, to seek and save the lost. We see in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, this is why Jesus came. This is why we love Jesus. For those, if you have someone in your life like they really love Jesus, it's because they get this. Jesus came on mission. In the brokenness of this world, in the midst of incredible grief, he's on a mission. He sees our need, and he breaks for us. He's come here with a mission to rescue and to save, to deliver, to take the broken and make it whole. And the brokenness is overwhelming. The grief is overwhelming. I don't know how you would respond to this scenario. I, I've been in grief before. I've had things pile up in my life. And the, the thing that I just, as I read this, I would think is, do you, do you not see that I'm hurting? You're so needy. Well, can't you see that I just need my own space right now? But the text guides us that that's not at all what Jesus does. That as Jesus prepared to get away and as he comes to the shore, he sees the crowd and he has compassion, sponkitsomai. That his heart breaks for the brokenness of these people. And he goes into action. He sees us. He sees the need. He doesn't meet the people with condemnation for all the sin and all the brokenness they participated in. No, he has the power to transform and he breaks for them. This is what Jesus does. It's not like me. I thank God for that. Moved with compassion, he goes to the crowd, he carries out these healings. And, and it's really important for us to know this too, not just to read this as a story or a historical event so long ago. In fact, the truth is, is that this is real life for us today. That Jesus today, I don't know where you've come from or where, what life has looked like this week for you, but he sees you and he sees your brokenness and pain. For some of us, maybe we have found that we have true illness and the Lord sees us and knows us. There's despair, there's hurt, there's loss. And Jesus sees us, and he doesn't meet us with just figure it out. He meets us with compassion, with love, with love that can transform. That's the God that we come and serve. And so, so that's the good news, is that right off the bat, I want to follow Jesus because he loves me. He cares for me. We serve a God of compassion We'll go to our second point here. As Jesus uh, sees this crowd, he heals everyone, and he carries out all these miracles. Other accounts say not only is he uh, healing, but he's teaching. But basically, Jesus gets busy, and he gets busy all day long. So, so much so that his disciples have to come near him and say, hey, Jesus, it's getting kind of late. We're in a desolate place. You got to send these people away. You see, the disciples are concerned. This is a big crowd, 15,000 people. I, I, I cook for about 14 people or so in my life group every week. I could not imagine 15,000. I just, 5,000, I couldn't imagine anything more than that, like in, in, in a pinch. 15,000, what are we going to do? Jesus, send them away. Send them away. It's an amazing thing here if you follow the disciples up to this point. They don't care about anybody but themselves. And we could kind of read this with some skepticism, but I want to read this. I know this might be hard for us in New Jersey. I want to read this with true intent. They're concerned for all these people. Sure, they're a little concerned for themselves, but Jesus, you got to send these people away. They're going to be really hungry. We're going to be in a really bad spot. We're in a desolate place. Send them away. And I love Jesus' response. I mean, we should praise God for this. This is like, God at work in them. They're always thinking about themselves. And here they are. They're thinking about other people. And, and here's what Jesus says. He hears their concern and says, I love that idea. But don't send them away. 
You give them something to eat. You give them something. I love that you're thinking about other people. That's like my whole thing, man. But you give them something to eat. Bible commentator Daniel Doriani, I don't have the slide for you because it's brief. I just want you to hear these words. Jesus has set the disciples on a problem that they cannot solve. He has, set, he has recognized their concern and he's given them a charge that they have no ability to meet. There's a lot of people here and they're hungry. You feed them. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a couple ways to respond here. The other accounts say that the, the disciples turn to themselves and they're like, I don't know. I mean, if we had 200 denarii, 200 days wages, we probably couldn't provide enough food for these people. It's like eight months of work. So, so what, what do we do? How do we do this? There's a couple ways we can respond. And, and, and as God reveals to you the brokenness of this world, there's likely a couple of ways that you respond. Do you just kind of recognize the circumstances that we see, the things that are overwhelming, the brokenness of this world, and just say, can't really do anything about that. I'm so sorry that's happening, but you kind of excuse yourself out of there. It's like, not really something I could do, see ya. Or maybe you have the, the makeup where you're just like, oh my goodness, you're just overtaken by the hurt, the loss, the brokenness. And you're just, we got to get everybody together. We got to pull, we got to we got to keep going. And you keep yourself so busy to try to meet the need. Or, do you recognize that there's little you can do, but the most important thing you could do is you can go to the Lord. With the little that you have, and ask him to possibly intervene on something that is impossible. There's a couple ways we can respond here. And Jesus is allowing his followers to figure it out. How are you going to respond? Eh, it's over. I can't do anything about it. Oh, we got to go. Yeah. Lord, what are we going to do here? We don't really know truly what happens here, but we do know that their concern leads to Jesus' charge. And the truth is, is that they didn't think it was possible. Because I wouldn't think it's possible. And you wouldn't think it's possible. Impossible is what Jesus does. Jesus takes this moment to show the 12 and all those in attendance that all they need, he can provide. Do you believe that this morning? That all you need, Jesus can provide. Well, as a son of a caterer, this next thing is amazing. Because here they are, they're set. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, bring this stuff to me. Bring this stuff to me. Verse 18. I'll read it again. After discovering that they only have five loaves and two, fi two fish, Jesus says, and said, bring them to me, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. I mean, talk about the greatest of all time. He puts the ring into catering. He's the best. Nobody was expecting a meal. They were in this desolate place. And what does Jesus do? Everyone has enough food. They organize this amazing thing. Everybody sit down. Sit down in the grass here. You see, the, the true... Amazing thing is that the disciples really are the MVPs of this whole thing. They are busy. They, they, they respond to Jesus with their concern. They, they go to work. They help the organization. And then Jesus starts to tell them. He takes the bread and he breaks it and he looks, he looks up to the heavens and he says a blessing. And then what, what happens? He gives the food back to the disciples and they start handing it out. And they handed it out and there's more. There's more. 
That, can you imagine this? Could you imagine from the very little what it must have been like to be, <laughs> what are we doing here? I mean, met with amazement. Look at this. There were just five little loaves of bread, two fish, more and more. These are fishermen. You don't think as they're handing it out, they're like, imagine if we had to fish for all this? You know how, much, how long it would take us to fish for all this fish? Think about the bread. They couldn't buy cheap loaves of bread. Get the barley, grind it down, mix it up, form it, throw it in the oven, take it out. How long would this have taken? How much work could never happen? And as they're handing it out, you don't think they're just like laughing at themselves? This is crazy. This is nuts. They had to have been thinking about it. All four of the Gospels recite, tell us about it. They were astonished by this. They were met with amazement, awe, and wonder. Think about how all of this, the, the, there really were. That not only were the hosts, everybody sit down here, not only were they serving all the food, but then they became busboys. All right, go back to the food. See, go back to the table. See what was left over. And they start to bring it back. And how much is left? Twelve baskets. For the twelve close followers of Jesus, a testament that only God can provide. With the little that we have, God can provide. He is amazing. You see, what's at play here is truly remarkable. Matthew shows us who is king. He shows us who's king. In the beginning part of Matthew chapter 14, we are introduced to King Herod, who is a sleazeball. He is a sleazeball. He's a puppet king who throws a drunken party, who is aroused by his niece and promises her way too much, and he, in the shame of himself, kills a righteous man like John the Baptist. King Herod. No, that's not the king. What does Matthew show us? There is a king and his name is Jesus. Do you see that? That at his banquet table, all are fed. At King Herod's table with all the social life, all, everybody of high ranking, all the, all the food you could want, all the drink you could want, but the people are empty. They're void. They're lost and broken and left into darkness. And then at Jesus' bare tables, in the midst of the wilderness, on the grass, what happens? The Lord provides not only what will sustain them in their stomachs, but he promises to make us whole in our souls. That, that, that as I think about someone who constantly is making food and thinking about food, I mean, Jesus really does a miracle here. It's, this isn't by mistake. He doesn't, he doesn't just make a big soup, right? Like, that's what I would think. I got to make a big soup. I got all these people, you know? He doesn't get, uh, you know, a couple thousand eggs and start making a big frittata for all our paisans, right? Like, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, add pasta or rice or potatoes and try to stretch the meal. What he does is an unmitigated miracle. It can't be contested. What Christ does is a miracle, and it's, it is a testimony to us because what is little in our hands becomes enough in the hands of Christ. Amen? What is small and insignificant is enough in the hands of Jesus. You see, Christ proves his deity, that he is God. He's not just a good teacher. He's not a miracle worker. He's God. That the Jews would remember as they're sitting around in these, in these, uh, these groups and as the disciples are going back and forth that this is, this is God. As the Israelites were in a desolate place in the wilderness in the book of Exodus, as they were traveling away from Egypt to the promised land, what does God provide for them? Their daily bread, manna from heaven. And what does Jesus do here? From seemingly nothing, what does he provide? A physical meal with bread and fish to sustain their stomachs. But the Gospel of John even pushes it further as Jesus and his disciples are talking about this afterwards, trying to gain understanding. The disciples want to know what, what just happened. Jesus' response is here. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, 
as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the, this world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not, be, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What Jesus is assuming is not just a good teacher or a miracle worker. He's not just trying to do play on words here. He's making a declarative statement. I am, and it has incredible significance here, that Jesus uses the personal name of God, Yahweh. I am the bread of life. The thing that will sustain you. I am life. He says, I am the resurrection and life in another part. That Jesus is life. That you look to no other thing. No food will satisfy you and sustain you. Like Jesus, I am the bread of life. Church, Jesus sees us and he sees this broken world. And instead of meeting us with condemnation, he wells up with compassion. He sees our great need and splunkizo mine. He breaks for us. And he doesn't just say, oh, that's really sad. He does something about it. You see, Christ came as a perfect and spotless sacrifice. He lived in perfection, in obedience to the Father, but would die the death of sinners. Jesus lived the life we couldn't live and died the death that we deserve to die. That Jesus' sacrifice on the cross paid for the punishment, the brokenness, of all of our sin, all of the things that you have experienced in this life, the brokenness, the hate, the illness, all this inflicted on you, and yes, all the things that you have actively and willingly participated in, seeking your own satisfaction. Jesus came to die for the sin that set, separates you from God so that he would unite us back to himself. Jesus is a miracle-working God. This is what we call and continually to call the upside-down kingdom of God. That Jesus is taking all of the brokenness of this world and he's flipping it back right where it should be. The fact that he compares King Herod and, and now we, in Matthew and we see King Jesus at work, things are different than how we thought, think they should be. King's tables, a royal feast, isn't what you think in, pal in, in the palace of Herod. No, it's in the fields with Jesus. It's going to Jesus itself. That's the feast. That's the thing that sustains. That's the thing that works. And so in Christ's compassion, we're met here, and Jesus pays it all, and he calls us to trust in faith, to repent of your sin, to turn away from it, and to turn to Christ, to trust that all that Jesus has provided is enough, that the, the, the work that Jesus has accomplished is a free gift. It was not about the performance or the obedience of the disciples or that crowd that day. Jesus reveals himself as a free gift, undeserved, compelled by compassion, broken. He goes and he shows us our great need for himself, a bread that will forever sustain. We will never go hungry. And what we begin to witness is God taking the very little and making it enough making it exactly what we need. Our little faith, he begins to move mountains. Tiny bits of peace, he casts off anxiety. Small understanding of who he is, he gives us a new identity. He establishes us with confidence and security in a world that is constantly falling apart. He gives us himself. And we look around and we see that God is at work in taking the very little and making it enough. His blessings are way beyond comprehension. His favor transforms. It changes us. We're not the same. I'm not who I once was. How could we be any different at sitting at the royal feast of Jesus? How could we, how, how, how could we sit there and be like, I'm going to be like the same self I was? No, Jesus gave us himself. We understand this. For Christ, he calls us as Christians, if you, if you say you're a follower of Jesus, as we focus on truly what he saved us from, have you done that? The brokenness, the hurt, the loss, the grief, the bondage of, of addiction and worry, the 
anger. Jesus is a God who rescues and transforms. He can change our complete situation. And so I want you to consider, as I share with you, I want you to continue to to think about this. With my little, God does. With my little, God does enough. He does a miracle day in and day out. He is miraculous. He is transformative. I, I can think right off the bat, with my little, my own limitation, I joke about this with you, I'm not a great reader. I've had struggles with reading my whole life. And with my little, my willingness to follow and be an obedient to the call of God in my life, guess what? With my little, God allows me to speak the truth of life into people's hearts. That God uses my words, which are messed up, befuddled, to help people take steps of obedience and following after God. Only God can do that. With my little, God can do. With my little, I remember getting married with my wife, and we were two broke-as-a-joke college students right after we we went to college. We were sitting on so much debt, we were afraid of it. We had to name it. We, We had to pay off Sally Mae and send her away, finally. And with our little, in obedience to God, what did God do? He not only gave us the victory of that, of seeing the peace of having our finances in order and obedience to him, but the gift of being generous, way more than we could ever imagine how he's blessed us. Only God can do that. Only God can do those works. A a life living on mission for him, saying, yes, God, I want to follow you. I want to give you my life. With my little, my days and my nights, God, would you use me? I'm not perfect, but God, would you use me? The blessing of seeing lives transformed, people taking that step of belief, becoming a disciple of Jesus, walking away from the death that they were living in and walking in the newness of life that Christ has provided. In humility, getting to witness God, rescue marriages, informing them and, and saving them. Seeing people in addiction be freed. Over and over and over again, we look at my little that God, I've given you, God, just a small deposit. And you have wowed me with your grace. What about you? With the gifts that God has given you, your time, your talent, your treasure, what has God proven to do? The impossible. I I, I promise you this to be the case. That with our very little, God will do far more abundantly that we could ever imagine. With our little, these little deposits, God, would you prove to be faithful in steps of obedience? God, would you use this, not for my good? I'm not telling you this so that you feel rich and happy. You can go to some churches where they say bigger houses, nicer cars, bigger page. I'm not saying that. In fact, the scriptures kind of point the opposite. To follow Jesus, there's struggle. To follow Jesus, there's suffering because you're living in a world that worships, worships a kingdom that's fallen and broken where we're worshiping a kingdom that's not of this world and a king that's not of this world. That the, the, the things that we value as true treasure, they're not celebrated in this life. And so I'm not telling you that the good things are coming to you. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying to walk in obedience and to see that truly following after Jesus and giving him your very little, he shows you that what he has is enough that he changes your desires, that what you value and how you see what he has for you is truly worth living for. It's truly worth living for. That in his hands, we can see that his grace truly is amazing. That Jesus performed this miracle in front of thousands and millions and millions and millions have read about this event over and over and over again, and we stand in awe of it. And that there are people in your life right now that need Good news. They need to know that there is a feast, a meal that's prepared by a king that once you participate in this, you'll never go hungry again. That you would would go to him and that you would be near to him. Has God placed someone in your heart? I want you to think of that person. Has God placed someone in your heart that you, like the disciples, with concern, with Christ, with compassion, that you would go near to them and that God would allow you to sit with them and serve them the bread of life. That you would be able to offer them life that sustains, truly found in Christ alone. You see, as Jesus, uh, if, if you've been around this church for some time or walking with Jesus for some time, this always should bring up an image here. Jesus with bread, blessing it. You see, in the last few hours of Jesus' life, 
Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, hey, listen, this is my body. My body broken for you. You see, Jesus, like those many little pieces of broken bread, it was a foreshadowing of what we would see come back. That Christ would experience the true brokenness of this world, the true brokenness of our sin. We wouldn't experience. He's the one who takes the broken pieces and makes it whole, but he himself has become broken. His blood would be shed just like the wine was poured out. For the forgiveness of your sin, your sin leads to certain death. It is a danger. The the call is to turn away from the danger, the the precipice, the, the cliff, and to turn to Christ. Only he can save. He has not come to throw you off the cliff. He's come to rescue you. Would you bend your will to him and respond and trust in him? We're going to get an opportunity to do this. I want to call those that are going to be serving communion forward to pass out these communion elements. And that as we look at the bread and as we hold the cup in our hand, I want you to know this, that Jesus died for your sins. It's not about your performance. If you have not trusted in Christ, the bread of life, I want to ask you to allow this cup to pass from you, to not participate. It would be an empty ritual that this is intended for those that truly recognize Christ is the bread of life. He is, he is the, the, the blood, the wine shed and poured out for the forgiveness of sins. That we recognize that truly what we need is something we can't provide for ourselves. It's been provided perfectly in Jesus. And so this morning, that uh, if you're walking with Jesus and you hold that cup in your hand, I want you to take time, reflective time, to consider, to remember. That's what this is for. To remember that Jesus so loves you. To ask God to reveal, Holy Spirit, reveal this to me. Areas of unbelief and unforgiveness. Me gripping my life for my own will rather than trusting you with the very little I have. God, would you offer me, would you take this time before the Lord? And then as a church family, our desire is always to participate in this together. And so you just hold on to that. Just a little bit, we're going to have some quiet reflection. And then what we'll do is we'll participate together in a short time.